the Center for Audit Quality's Profession in Focus. I'm Dennis McGowan, Senior Director in the Professional Practice at the Center for Audit Quality. Today, we'll be talking about the use and presentation of non-GAAP financial measures in a COVID-19 environment. Our topics will include a brief overview of the SEC rules and guidance around non-GAAP. We'll explore some investor perspectives on why non-GAAP is so important. We'll talk a bit about the trends of non-GAAP from Q1, as well as what to expect from non-GAAP in Q2 and beyond. I'm really excited to be joined by Todd Castagno of Morgan Stanley and Stephen Jacobs of EY. Todd, could you please introduce yourself for our listeners? Uh, yes, thanks for having me. So in my, my capacity, I'm a uh, accounting and tax policy analyst at Morgan Stanley. And what that means is I help institutional investors and, and analysts better understand and use accounting uh, and tax data, as well as changes in accounting and tax policy. Great, thanks, Todd. Stephen, can, can you introduce yourself? Sure, Dennis. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Stephen Jacobs. I'm uh, a partner at EY. I'm actually America's Director of Capital Markets and our SEC practice. And I also am fortunate enough to be the chair of the Center for Audit Quality's SEC Regulations Committee. Great, well, thank you both for, for being here today. So with that, why don't we, we get started? So starting with an overview of the SEC's requirements, you know, we all know that non-GAAP financial measures continue to be an area that the SEC has, has been focused on, and I believe a, a top area of, of comment from the SEC staff. So Stephen, would you mind giving us a bit of an overview on the guidance and interpretive rules that, that address uh, the presentation and use of non-GAAP financial measures? Uh, sure, Dennis. So just a level set, the, uh, the non-GAAP rules issued by the SEC um, came out back in 2003 um, there's been a, a, a number of different interpretive pieces of guidance that have come out from the staff since that point of time. And I will say the pendulum it has somewhat swung over the years as to the SEC's uh, rigor and focus on non-GAAP measures. Uh, we're certainly currently sitting in a time where the SEC is very focused on non-GAAP measures. You know, specifically, I'll say they're focused on that the measures you know, aren't misleading and um, that the measures don't that don't have undue prominence over GAAP, so that GAAP always is more prominent than the non-GAAP measures. You know, I'll say specifically recently, we've heard Chairman Clayton comment a lot on non-GAAP measures. You know, back in December, he expressed some concerns about non-GAAP measures being window dressing, um, highlighted that they, they shouldn't be window dressing, and that if non-GAAP measures are actually used by management, if they're communicated to the board, you know, those would be indicative of more meaningful non-GAAP measures. And the final thing I'll really point out that we observe in UI, we do a survey of comment letters issued by Corp Fin really each year. And if you look back over the past two or three years, with the one exception of the adoption of ASC 606, um, non-GAAP measures have really been the number one source of comment by the SEC staff in their reviews of public company filings. So, so definitely a matter of focus and continued focus for the staff. Thanks, Stephen. That, that's very helpful. So, so Todd, you know, just turn to you a little bit here. And, and I know, um, Stephen, you mentioned kind of the SEC's pendulum, uh, uh, you know, swinging back and forth with their focus on non-GAAP. You know, just as we think back to, to 2016, when the SEC did update their, their CMDIs on, on non-GAAP, you know, how, has, how have you as an investor seen some changes or differences in, in kind of where we are today versus where we were in 2016 when the compliance and disclosure interpretations were, were updated by the SEC staff? Yeah, first, I guess a level set for how investors use, use and view non-GAAP measures. You know, they really are kind of a critical supplement to the GAAP financials. So in some cases, they're used to, to supplement where GAAP perhaps wasn't designed to uh, require certain reporting requirements, or there might be elements that just don't exist in GAAP. So as a, as a couple examples here that I have, you know, I think about the metric EBITDA, and we can all have our opinion on what EBITDA is, but you know, that's, that's a common metric that doesn't exist in, in, in generally accepted accounting principles, but it is used by investors, it's used by creditors, it's used by management teams for, for performance. You know, the other common element, I think in non-GAAP measures is non-recurring items. So investors always are forward looking, right? So they want to understand What's going to be persistent? What's the company's future cost structure? So if there's one-time items like a restructuring or impairment or COVID-related expenses, right? Having that information in there so they can adjust their baseline is really how we, you know, um, apply information, apply our forecast. And then there's areas where perhaps investors may not 
um, fully agree with generally accepted accounting principles or there's areas of, of complexity and comparability within GAAP. So, you know, example is mark to market of investments. You know, that, that kind of volatility might not be indicative of, of the company's um, operating structure. So companies use these adjustments in order to give, I think, investors a view of how they manage the business, how they manage performance, and also allows investors to get a nice context for, for what a baseline is, as well as how they can use that information to project in the, in the future. What I would say, you know, to your question about how we've evolved, I do think, you know, if you go back five years or where we call it more novel adjustments. Um, and, you know, I think the, the, the plus side to the CDNIs and the updating of the guidance and the comment letters, I do think you have more comparability. Um, I do think from my perspective, also working with our investment banking teams, um, companies are, you know, the control framework around non-GAAP measures and certain types of adjustments, I think their level of tension is, is, is certainly a bit higher than it was. Um, and I think a lot of the, the basis in, in disclosure around why an adjustment is being used is generally more robust than what it was, say, five years ago. Great, Todd. That, that's all very, very helpful. Um, Stephen, just turning to you for a second here. Um, you know, the SEC has been, you know, in, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, I think they were pretty active in getting out statements and guidance about, you know, what challenges companies may be facing as it relates to the pandemic. Um, and so I just thought we, we could, as we're talking about the SEC guidance, you know, what have the SEC staff said or, or what has their focus been specifically as it relates to non-GAAP and, and COVID-19? Yeah, it's interesting, Dennis. So the SEC has put out really two pieces of disclosure guidance that have come from the Corp Fin staff. Uh, disclosure guidance topic nine and, and guidance topic 9A. Um, interestingly enough, notwithstanding what I said earlier, there's, there's only a, a little bit in there in topic nine about non-GAAP measures. And the primary focus on non-GAAP measures in that disclosure guidance is just disclosure, really what the companies should disclose if they were to use non-GAAP measures, specifically how management uses the measures and how those measures are useful to investors, which are both required disclosures um, under item 10E of regulation SK. So what we've kind of done is drawn a little bit on in our experience and through the comment letter process, interactions with the SEC staff, other interpretations as to how, kind of get in their head a little bit, how we think they might approach COVID related non gap measures. So when we think about those, um, we kind of have two, two buckets, I would say. There's kind of one bucket of non gap measures or adjustments to non gap measures that are your ordinary non gap adjustments that people commonly make even in a non COVID, non pandemic environment. Impairment charges, restructuring charges, a lot of those items may be larger because of the effects of the pandemic. So but we do think companies have been and will continue to make those adjustments. Uh, the second category is kind of things that more are pandemic specific. And this is where I think it gets very judgmental and companies have really challenged, been challenged to figure out what may or may not be appropriate. So you know, as we have thought about it and kind of evaluated well, what, what measures there, what adjustments may be appropriate, it seems that if a company could articulate how a particular item is one directly attributable to the pandemic, you know, two incremental, you know, to their expenses and, and three really separable from their normal operations. You could then kind of put a box around it and say, okay, this is really related to the pandemic. And then perhaps it's appropriate to adjust for. Um, so if you think about things like hazard pay, you know, early on people were incurring a lot of costs to clean facilities for decontamination you know, things that you could draw back to the pandemic and were it not for the pandemic, they are types of items the company really never would have incurred. Um, comparing that with things that are more ordinary, uh, recurring operating expenses that may have fluctuated solely due to the pandemic. So payroll costs is an example of that. You know, we had a lot of discussions with, with people who are looking to adjust payroll costs if they were continuing to pay maybe furloughed staff or staff that just weren't working, you know, to us that didn't, didn't feel right because that was payroll costs you were going to be incurring before the pandemic, you were going to be incurring it after the pandemic. We thought maybe that was an area the staff might challenge. Other areas were really inventory impairment. Companies 
you know, over time as part of their business that do have to write down inventory, those amounts, and those ordinarily would not be uh, normal non-GAAP adjustments. Those numbers may have gotten bigger because of COVID, but we didn't think that should drive um, a non-GAAP adjustment there. I think another area that companies were focused on was, well, our revenues are going down because maybe our stores are closed or something like that. Can we factor in and add back what those lost revenues are? And I think that was another area that you know didn't, didn't feel appropriate as we kind of thought about it, um, as it'd be more of a pro forma measure rather than adjusting historical uh, results. So you know, based upon all that, I think that kind of helped us at least think through a framework. And I think a lot of companies have been thinking about it the same way. And I will say, in any case, whatever companies do, disclosures are certainly important. So transparency to make sure the measures are not misleading. You know, the reconciliation that Todd talked about, that the line items are clear in there. And I think the other thing that's important to mention that is that if any of this led to changes in historically used non-GAAP measures, so if the definitions have changed for what companies have historically presented, you know, one, they need to be transparent about those changes, uh, but two, they may need to consider whether are there are similar items maybe in historical periods that may require them to actually recast those, those non-GAAP measures in historical periods as well. Thank you, Stephen. That's all extremely helpful. Um, I, I think, you know, turning to, to you, Todd, um, and, and I think, you know, Stephen said a lot there about kind of how you know what companies are thinking about as 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 they're making adjustments and and you know the, the focus on on non-GAAP as they think about those things certainly in a COVID-19 environment you know and even as you spoke a little bit earlier about how how investors are using this information when you were level setting you know with all this focus on the the the, the non-GAAP you know what you know is the gap still important um, and and you know how, how does that interplay with, with the non-GAAP. Yeah, that, that, that's a good question, because um, a lot of times I think you hear that investors only focus on non-GAAP, so why are we still <laughs> using the gap? And that's really not true. So the gap is the baseline. So every analyst who builds a model to develop their forecast, you, you always start with the gap financials. And again, the non-GAAP is very helpful supplemental information that we use. So you really, if you think, if you look at an analyst model, generally, you, you basically have two. You have, a, you have the full gap information, then you, you can adjust that information again, to get you with a with and without approach. So you have a better interpretation of the data, which allows you to hopefully make, make better forecasts. So um, by no means I, would I say that that gap is being replaced by non-gap, um, but it is in a critical supplement to help with the suite of information. Sure, th thanks, Todd. Um, moving on a bit to, and I know, Stephen, you already touched a little bit on, on how companies were thinking about this, you know, in, in Q1, but I think if we could just talk about that a little bit further, just given that as, as you know, the, the pandemic really, the, a lot of the stay-at-home orders and other mitigation efforts really started kind of towards the end of Q1 for, for those calendar year-end companies right before they were closing out their quarters and, and starting to report. And so, you know, what are some of your observations from, um, from, from that period of time and, and, and how companies were thinking about non-GAAP in, in that environment? Yeah, yeah, sure, Dana. So I think a, a lot of companies kind of went through those considerations, you know, that I mentioned earlier. And I think in going through those considerations and, and thinking about how, how pervasive uh, the impacts of the pandemic were, uh, we actually found that only a minority of companies ended up using kind of specific COVID-related adjustments, putting aside the impairments, the restructurings, kind of those other items. Really only 25% of companies, kind of this is really through I more informal surveys, um, indicated that they would likely be making COVID adjustments in, in Q1. And we think that's consistent um, with what we've seen. Again, because the impacts were so pervasive, it really becomes challenging to present a single measure that really captures the impact of the pandemic. So at, instead of that, as a result, what we really saw companies doing was really trying to quantify those impacts separately, uh, sometimes in a tabular fashion, but not getting to a, a total and not getting to an adjusted total, but by line item maybe explaining kind of what the impacts were. Some did it more narratively um, to the extent they really could quantify 
what that specific impact was. So, you know, I think that's kind of where the practice started to go. Uh, again, we did see some limited adjustments. I think companies who felt like they could isolate some of those impacts use them. But for the, the a lot of company, it was, it was really separately quantifying the changes. Um, the other observation I think we really had that I just want to highlight is kind of separate but related to non-GAAP measures is key performance indicators. And those often do go hand in hand, uh, especially recently. Everyone knows the SEC recently issued interpretive guidance earlier this year, pre-pandemic, um, related to key performance indicators and what disclosures should be providing when using key performance indicators. But the key performance indicators a lot of companies use in various industries really were got a little bit out of whack um, due to the pandemic. I mean, some negatively, but some also positively for companies that were you know, positively impacted by, by the endemic, pandemic. And therefore companies really needed to explain those variations um, and, and also challenge kind of whether that comparison or that historical trend was, was a meaningful one. Uh, so in some cases it just resulted in a lot of expanded disclosure to try to explain what drove changes in the KPIs and maybe what companies can expect going forward. Um, in other situations similar to non-GAAP, as I mentioned earlier, I think companies needed to rethink, one, the use of those KPIs and possibly, two, how they define those KPIs. And so we did see some changes there as well. So just a reminder there, you know, companies who've had to make changes to those key performance indicators and how they think about them, you know, that also, you know, following the SEC's interpretive guidance, would require a lot of transparency about those changes um, and also kind of explaining the way the KPI was calculated, you know, how it's now calculated, and then in most cases recasting that KPI for historical periods to get that, that comparability. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. I think um, turning you to you, Todd, for, for for a second there, you know, as as Stephen was was explaining, kind of how companies thought about this in in, in Q1 and and some of the decisions they made and how they reported things, you know, what did you as an investor find useful um, in the non-GAAP measures that were being reported by companies during Q1? It's a good question, and I guess as a user of information. Um, my observations kind of echo what's what Stephen described, where you don't you didn't see a lot of um, individual discrete COVID line items or adjustments in non-GAAP measures. Um, generally, saw, you might have seen and you're seeing this so far in, in Q2 some of the more traditional line items adjustments, such as impairments um, or restructuring charges, may have grown a bit related to COVID, and you have discussion um, around why those balances may have, may have increased in certain cases. Um, the other thing I would say that, you know, if you think about the suite of information, a lot of management teams are describing their COVID-related expenses or charges either in the period or, or in the future, you know, perhaps outside the non-GAAP measures. So, you know, as a good example of that is, is Pepsi just uh, announced its earning, earnings earlier this week, and they announced $400 million worth of COVID-related charges for employee safety and, and, and health. Um, so that's, you know, another way that management teams can, can communicate um, this information, and we're seeing a lot of that, I'd say, so far this earnings cycle through the through the, the transcripts as well as uh, dialogue with management teams. That is what investors want to understand, is how has the cost structure changed in the near term due to COVID, and ultimately what will it look like as we exit, hopefully exit this COVID cycle in the next uh, few months. Great, thank you. Thank you, Todd. And I think that's a good segue into uh, as we think about Q2 as, as, as that gets underway. And you mentioned even some, some companies that have already started to report, you know, how will Q2 be different than, than Q1 and maybe even, you know, Q2 and beyond. And now that, you know, this might be until, until we get out of the pandemic, a bit of the new normal, um, how does that play into how companies should be thinking about um, what they adjust for, you know, in their gap to arrive at their non-gap? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, the way everything has kind of transpired over the past several months, obviously the impact on Q2 is, is so much more significant um, than it was for Q1. Uh, so I think a couple things for companies to think about in their Q2 reporting. One, they want to evaluate to, to make sure that 
the non-GAAP measures or the way they're talking about the pandemic is consistent uh, quarter to quarter, or to the extent they're making changes in those measures, like I talked about before, or changes in how they talk about it, they need to make sure they're transparent about those changes so that investors could understand the story over the course of the year. Um, I'd also say if com some companies, as I talked about earlier, are opting to more quantify the impacts. So I think we'll see a lot more of that in Q2 and those impacts, as I mentioned, will be a lot greater. Uh, so I think some things to think about when companies are quantifying the impacts is really how objective um, are those amounts, those calculations? In other words, is there a lot of judgment and estimation in there or can they really isolate the impacts of COVID? Uh, I think two things that companies probably should be careful about in doing that and in, in kind of isolating those impacts. I think one, um, it's important for them to be objective because I think there could be a concern out there that now with the pandemic and, and how you know, devastating it's really been for a lot of companies that they could have had some other bad things going on, other adverse events leading into the pandemic or perhaps now unrelated to the pandemic and therefore kind of using the pandemic could, could kind of uh, obscure a little bit some of the other factors. And I think that would be concerning uh, to the SEC staff. Um, I think also the other thing to think about, and you kind of mentioned beyond, I mean, there is some period of time, Dennis, where we may start to come out of the pandemic. Some things will be the new normal, as you mentioned. Um, but as we start to come out of the pandemic, and maybe things don't turn in the way companies have expected, right? How are companies gonna be able to explain that and kind of be able to bifurcate, okay, what is pandemic related and setting expectations for what might, what might happen in the future and what is completely unrelated to the pandemic. Um, so I think companies will certainly have to think about that as well. Thanks, Stephen. Anything from an, an investor perspective, Todd? I think, you know, you, you mentioned earlier, kind of trying to understand, what, you know, what 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 it looks like in the short term, and maybe what it, what it looks like when when we we emerge from COVID nineteen. But but just as we think about Q two and and the pandemic having been you know affecting the entire quarter, anything different you're looking for as an investor from from non GAAP financial measures or KPIs as as you think about Q two reporting? Yeah, and you know it's interesting because we're we're early days here. Um, you know, so if we see a, an increased inflection in COVID specific adjustments, you know, that's some one of the items we're looking for. So far, we really have not. We've seen more dialogue or, um, and context around the reported um, numbers and how COVID has impacted those numbers. Um, you know, one thing to think about, I think, especially in context of what Stephen just described, is a lot of management teams have pulled down their forward looking guidance. And most of the time, that guidance is really based on kind of the non GAAP measures and non GAAP metrics. So there is kind of a, a relationship there between how are they going to formulate their non-GAAP measures and then what does that mean for their guidance? Um, and I think that's a, that's a challenge as well in this time. I think management teams want to give guidance. Investors clearly want their guidance back so they can help um, you know, estimate the future. Um, but it's another complexity we have to think about um, in, this, in this realm. Great, thank you, Todd. Well, really just wanna thank you both for, for your time and, and your insights today. I think this was a great discussion and you certainly gave our, our listeners and our viewers a lot to think about. This certainly isn't a, a simple topic. And so your, your, your perspectives are, are very helpful as, as everyone navigates the, the new normal, as I, as I already said once. Um, but but so, so really thank you for your time and, and appreciate it.